few more seconds. Namrata, go ahead. Uh, a few more seconds. I think it's just still streaming. Yep. Namrata, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Greetings and welcome to this SAPAN event titled Refugee Crisis in South Asia. I'm Namrata Sharma, a journalist and women's rights advocate in Kathmandu, Nepal. I'm a member of the executive board of Nepal National Commission for UNESCO and chair of its National Media Committee. I'm also founding, I'm also a member um, of the South Asia Peace Action Network, SAPAN, and your host for today's program. Today we at SAPAN, would like to express our utmost grief over the thousands of lives taken, including a large proportion of children, paying the heaviest price in the worsening Israel-Palestine situation. People continue to face dire circumstances with no end in sight. We join many international bodies in calling for an immediate ceasefire and for the restoration of basic needs for all those affected in the region. We also mourn the thousands of lives lost in Western Afghanistan due to the earthquake on October 8th. Today, we are shocked and deeply saddened for the loss of a pioneer in the field of climate justice, activism, Professor Salimul Haq. Director of the International Center for Climate and Change and Development. His sudden passing in Dhaka la late last night is a personal loss for many SAPAN members who knew him. We all always remember him for how he graciously accepted to send a video message for the SAPAN webinar on the eve of. COP26, despite being busy at the venue itself. Now to our topic of today. The refugee crisis in South Asia is a complex and multifaceted issue. By raising awareness about the crisis and discussing the challenges faced by refugees, we hope to contribute to finding solutions that will always re allow refugees to live in safety and dignity. I remember while I covered the Vietnamese refugees crisis in Nepal in the early 1990s, after they were forced out of Bhutan by, via India and granted refuge in eastern part of Nepal. I remember the fear, pain, frustration and agony they faced. Now in 2023, I'm witnessing the massive corruption scandal involved in the human trafficking of Nepali citizens faked at, as Bhutanese refugees and exported to the USA. Some Bhutanese refugees who were supposed to have been taken to the Western world still remain in Nepal with very little support. In today's webinar, we hope to raise awareness about the refugee crisis in South Asia, find out the significant and continuous challenges that have led to a sharp increase in the refugee population, examine the forced displacement of conflict affected population, such as the Rohingyas, Bhutanese, Tibetans, African refugees, and Afghan refugees into other regions, neighboring countries, and beyond. And not least, analysis analyze the current scenario of escalating issues and humanitarian concerns related to a large number of Afghan refugees in Pakistan and Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Discussing points will include, but need not be limited to, root causes of the refugee crisis in South Asia, impact of the refugee crisis on host countries and the refugees themselves, 
challenges faced by refugees in accessing basic necessities and services, role of international organizations in addressing the refugee crisis, and potential solutions to the refugee crisis itself. Before we proceed, I'd like to talk about some brief house rules. Please mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize the background noise. Please introduce yourself in the chat. Use the chat for questions or comments, but keep it on topic. And of course, kindly be respectful. Be patient with technical difficulties. We always seem to have that no matter what. As always, we invite suggestions and feedback from everybody. Now, I'd like to invite our guest, Shamla Saleem, a climate justice activist from Sri Lanka, to read out Sapan's Three Point Founder Charter. Shamla Saleem, Thank I you, Namrata. Yeah. Sapan's Three Point Founding Charter has been endorsed by over 50 organizations and nearly 400 individuals in the region and diaspora. The charter calls on the governments and people of South Asian nations to number one, institute soft borders to allow freedom of trade and travel to each other's countries. Number two, ensure human rights and dignity for all citizens, including religious and ethnic minorities. Number three, cooperate in all areas, particularly related to public health, culture and legal reform, education, environment, climate change and etc. The Sapan Charter is also online in several languages. Do take a look at the website www.southasiapeace.com and endorse the charter if you haven't already. Before I hand uh, it back to Namrata, I would like to mention that uh, in an effort to promote tourism, uh, the Sri Lankan cabinet recently approved an initiative to offer free visas to seven countries, including India. The pilot program will remain effective until March 31st, 2024. We hope to see similar efforts between other countries in the South Asian region. At this time, I would like to urge you to read the Sapan petition, Milinedo, uh, and sign it if you have not already, www.milinedo.com. Uh, meanwhile, the link will be shared in the chat. Thank you, and back to you, Namrata. Thank you so much, Shamla. A wonderful initiative from Sri Lanka indeed. And we have the special relation, Nepal and India. We have open border and Nepal also has, you know, visa upon arrival and no visa for many South Asian countries. Let us hope that this happens all over the region very soon. Uh, now we come to our panel discussion moderated by Kushi Kabir in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Kushi is a dedicated feminist and rights activist who advocates for environmental justice, human rights, and equality on regional and international platforms. Her work encompasses issues like land and water rights, secularism, and democratic values. Kushi is actively involved in public interest litigations, protecting marginalized communities, preventing environmental degradation, and fighting gender-based violence. She was the first woman to work in rural areas after Bangladesh's liberation in 1971 and continues her work with Nigeria Kori, a nonprofit empowering rural communities. Kushi's influence extends to various national and regional boards and networks where she challenges patriarchy and promotes citizen entitlements. She is also affiliated with organizations such as Sangat, and the One Billion Rising Campaign. Kushi Kabir holds a degree in fine arts from Dhaka University and is also a Sapan founding member. Kushi, over to you. Thank you so much, Labrata. I almost couldn't recognize myself when you introduced me. So we will begin with the actual the discussion and the panelists. And we have a very uh, amazing bunch of people, panelists, five from uh, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, I would like to introduce them. We have Ravi Nair from India. Uh, I'll 
when each one speaks, I'll give a little bigger introduction about them. Shirin Haq from Bangladesh, uh, Sabah Gul Khatak from Pakistan, Razia Sultana from Bangladesh slash, uh, she's, uh, she's from the Rohingya area, Arakan, and uh, Seema Samar from Afghanistan. So I will start with asking Ravi Nair. I'll give a little in introduction. Ravi Nair has been the executive director of the South Asia Human Rights Documentation Center since October, 1990. His notable achievements, including receiving the M.A. Thomas National Human Rights Award in 1997 and delivering lectures at Iowa University and Harvard Law School, among others. He's been an international consultant for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, where he also conducted training workshops in Nepal and Armenia. Additionally, he has conducted workshops in 30 other countries and contributed to human rights curriculum development in India. Ravina advocates for refugee rights, assisting various refugee groups and intervening with India's National Human Rights Commission. He has also received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the All India Muslim Majlis, uh, Mushawarat, for his dedication to protecting minorities in India. So Ravi Nair, uh, without much ado, I give it to you. I, you have seven minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, I will be frank. I will not touch country situations, which I'm quite aware of, but go to the broad picture. And I will be uh, quite controversial in them, but feel free to ask me as tough questions as you need in the discussion space. First of all, I wish the uh, topic on the blurb circulated uh, was as in the concept note. Refugee crisis is a little too alarmist. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I believe that the major refugee crisis is what we are seeing, uh, which is protracted in West Asia between uh, Palestine and Israel. And the other two major crises the world is facing, which is sought to be uh, swept under the carpet by the Western media, is the one in the Mediterranean, where uh, everybody is, seeks to keep refugees from North Africa uh, and other African countries, as well as you see the situation in the American states, uh, Latin America, and on the land. So you, that's a, the second problem that you have globally and also in South Asia is the absolute lack of em empathy for refugees or for minorities or for people in need. There is, uh, uh, this is not the 60s or the 70s or even the 80s. There's a, there's a law of diminishing returns as far as human empathy is concerned. Third, the states are very weak in all South Asian countries. And the only uh, response to their weak governance is the militarization of the state, further militarization of the state. And they feel that will provide them the security uh, in a very short-sighted manner. The fourth problem is the uh, issue of international uh, pick and choose uh, situations. And this is fairly intrusive and one must be careful about it. Uh, the one example is the dismantling of the whole protection regime uh, given in the 51 convention and by custom and practice. Uh, this is why I always have had that the mere signing and ratification of the convention, 51 convention and the protocol are uh, red herrings. Uh, it would be better to have uh, uh, national, robust national uh, determination processes and refugee processes, given the political will, which unfortunately is lacking. Uh, judicial oversight on uh, protection issues on human rights refugees of human rights of refugees is extremely weak across the region. 
uh, India, which had a fairly decent Supreme Court in the past, is now, uh, uh, I shan't say more. Uh, 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 I have been fight fairly vocal on how they have been functioning when it comes to minority rights and refugee rights. I am a petitioner in one case in the Supreme Court and in a number of other petitions in the high courts. Uh, there is uh, no bilateral or multilateral cooperation in SARC on refugees. SARC is as dead as the dodo as on a number of issues, but clearly on migration policy and refugee rights, that's also something. Uh, the other issue that one needs to flag in any discussion is the increase in statelessness across the region. Uh, uh, and uh, that, again, needs to be looked at. Uh, second, all the nation states in South Asia uh, care a fig for international humanitarian law and human rights law. Unfortunate, but true. Uh, the UNHCR uh, mechanism is absolutely ineffectual. Uh, protection would be much better, better handled if it was part of the mandate of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, uh, UNSA should do what it does, uh, good, be, be a uh, rice, bread, and tents distribution agency, uh, rather than delve into areas of protection which it does not understand and does not do. Uh, second, uh, there, there is a lot of myths about in the international refugee world about mythical internal flight alternatives in many countries which produce refugees. They're absolutely mythical. Where, where can you have internal flight refugees uh, alternatives in any of these countries? Second, the humanitarian organizations uh, have not paid enough emphasis on education of refugees. Uh, that is an area that has to be done. The only success story is the brilliant work that the Jesuit Refugee Service and the Jesuit Education Association did with the Bhutanese refugees, which, pre which prepared them for their uh, resettlement in the U US and other Western countries. This kind of uh, very concentrated education program was not seen in any of the other refugee situations. And education is something that I need to uh, do. Secondly, governments are extremely weak in, in terms of their uh, sovereign functions in South Asia. Imagine outsourcing a sovereign function uh, like migration control to international agency, including UNSCR. Yeah. This, otherwise, they're very, very concerned about migration uh, and sovereignty. Then the whole concept of people being illegal. What's illegal about people trying to flee to a safer situation? Uh, this is a Western concept trying to keep away uh, black and brown people. You don't say illegal when Ukrainians are flooding into Germany or, Poli or uh, Poland. You only use the word when it comes to outside the Western world. I think there's a lot to do. So, lastly, uh, before I conclude, I am very wary of uh, debates on refugee crisis today, more so, because after West Asia, uh, uh, presently, South Asia is the biggest cockpit of international intrigue. And uh, uh, one must be careful about how people, we give levers to international uh, organizations to uh, further mu muddy the waters. And uh, they don't recognize the early signs of refugee flows, which is internal conflict, conflict, and major human rights violations and humanitarian law violations. At that stage, they are in, in massive slumber. Uh, and uh, so they only recognize it when people try to get to the West uh, 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 by hook or by crook, um, because they made uh, actual refugee uh, claims processes so difficult in the uh, industry. There is no due procedure or process available in any of the Western legal refugee determination process. And I know that because I have done workshops for the Canadian Immigration and Refugee Board, for uh, the Danish Foreign Ministry, and various other things on refugee flows. And I know exactly how their mindset works. 
and I'm uh, at the fag end of my career. I started working with refugees as an undergraduate in my first year in university with Iranian refugees fleeing uh, the Sabak of the Shah of Iran and uh, and uh, South African and Rhodesian refugees now called Zimbabwe on Indian government uh, scholarships to India who did not want to go as long as apartheid and the uh, Ian Smith regime were there and continued to stay in Iran in India only went back after apartheid was dismantled and Ian Smith was sh given the boot. So I'll stop here. I've num uh, I would have liked to talk about some of the situations, but we do have two major problems which we need to address, which is the Rohingya crisis in Bangladesh, which is slowly becoming a regional problem, at least in India and in Nepal to more limited extent. And of course, the ill-advised move by the Pakistan government uh, by trying to send back all of a sudden a million more or more Afghan refugees. They have been extremely uh, generous in their past. It's, it's a little befuddling uh, to understand what they are up to at present, because any analysis geopolitically of what uh, is the refugee factor in that area uh, doesn't throw up any cogent answers. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi, for that overview. And you gave a really quite a large, you know, white picture. And I, uh, and I thank you for mentioning both uh, the issue of the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, and which is now spilling over to other countries in the region, and also for bringing out the latest issue with the Afghan refugees in Pakistan. We decided to choose on these two uh, areas because every country in South Asia has issues in deciding how to deal with people who come to their country because they do not, to, their, to each host country, because they aren't able to survive. They're uh, victimized. There are all kinds of uh, uh, the policy is going on against them, and it's not out of choice, but it is out of compulsion that they're supposed to go. So we chose to focus on two. One is the Rohingya refugees, and the other is the Afghan refugees. So next we have in our discussion is Shireen Haq. I hope Shireen is ready now. Uh, Shireen is a very well-known, globally recognized activist a reputed leader in Bangladesh, a co-founder of Nari Pokho, a feminist activist group, which began exactly four decades ago. As a champion of women's rights and freedom of expression, she's involved in fighting issues related to democracy, human rights, and freedom of speech. While advocating for Rohingya refugees and the appalling situation they are still living in. She was instrumental in organizing the visit of the Women Nobel Peace Laureates to Rohingya camps early on in 2018, when the refugees first arrived. Shireen's extensive background includes many, many uh, areas, and she served as development advisor to Danida in Bangladesh from 87 to 2006, which uh, really helped at that time the Nordic countries to uh, understand what the issues were. So Shirin, I gave you a very, I gave a very brief uh, summary of the vast experience you have. I am give, handing it over to you and I'll give you five minutes. I hope you can finish with that. So Shirin, over to you. Thank you, Kushi, and thank you for all the kind and generous uh, words of praise, etc. Not all of which is not deserved, but anyway, I would like to start by first remembering Salimul Haq. It's a day of national loss for us. And uh, we have lost, in fact, uh, Bangladesh's global expert <coughs> on climate change. And it's a personal loss as well for me. The Rohingya influx into Bangladesh in 2017 was not the first time that the Rohingyas crossed over to Bangladesh but it has been the most massive influx. We had an influx earlier, but 
not only was it a smaller number, but many actually went back. But this is the first time that we have a huge influx in uh, 2017 August, and there's no sign of repatriation. Um, the discussions of, about repatriation sound very hollow. Um, there is, seems to be no political commitment on the part of the Myanmar regime to arrange for repatriation. They do not recognize the Rohingyas as part of their uh, part of their population. They refer to them as Bangladeshis and insist that Rohingyas are actually Bangladeshis who had encroached into their land. So this was this is a difficult situation. Um, this way, I'm sorry, there's something coming up in my screen. Okay, um, so this is the situation. Rohingyas are nearly 800,000 Rohingyas arrived in the 2017, joining the previously more than 250,000 who are already still here in camps. So we had a situation where we are uh, talking about a little over a million. Um, this is definitely more than the number of Rohingyas left in Rakhine district in, in Myanmar. The question of safety and dignity is always raised when it comes to the question of how refugees are to be treated in any, any host country. But having observed the situation very, at very close and firsthand, I have seen how both of those are very difficult to fulfill both safety and dignity. In fact, I think dignity is even more difficult to fulfill when you have a situation where people are crowded into a small area of land. Bangladesh is a population which is already overcrowded. And then you have a small tract of land which has been uh, taken over in a sense by refugee camps, uh, sometimes displacing local people, sometimes displacing forest, forest land. In this situation, despite best efforts, um, we, we are concerned that the Rohingya refugees are not enjoying either full, total safety nor dignity. There have been incidents quite frequent now, more frequent now than even last year, of shootouts in the camps. There's an active uh, armed Rohingya group. Um, volunteer workers, rescue workers, as well as refugee workers, health workers, etc., are not allowed in the camp after four, four o'clock in the afternoon. What happens after four o'clock till the next morning is uh, not visible to the Bangladeshi public. But this is when a lot of the shootouts are happening. And also, uh, she mentioned that I had been uh, instrumental in bringing three Nobel Peace Laureates to help amplify the voices of <coughs> Rohingya women. One of the particular things about this influx was that Rohingya women had been sexually violated by not only the Myanmar members of the Myanmar army, <coughs> the Tatmadaw, but also by Buddhist priests. And this situation had created uh, immense trauma. As people, I was there as people were crossing in and women were stopping to talk and they had absolutely no um, hesitation in describing what happened. I remember one particular woman describing how after the fifth person had raped her, she lost consciousness and she doesn't remember what happened, except that when she did come back to her consciousness, her husband had been killed and one of her children had been killed. And she and her brother managed to escape to Bangladesh after a 10 day walk through forests and through rough territory. So the question of mass rape of Rohingya women became a big issue. In 2017, when I went to the camps and, and, and actually not all of them were in camps, many were on the roadside at that time, even camps had not been built. This is what was topmost whenever I talked to any Rohingya woman was this, 
sexual violence they suffered. When I went back three or four years later, they no longer talked about the violence that they suffered at the hands of the <coughs> Tatmadaw, but they talked about the violence that was going on in the camps now. So this was something very, very disturbing that the camps were not enabling uh, safety to women. And um, this was happening, Rohingya women were being raped by Rohingya men, especially when they went out at night to use the toilet facilities, which were always uh, several, uh, maybe 50 yards away from the settlement area. And not, sometimes because of lack of proper lighting, and sometimes simply because there were people um, waiting for women to come out and, and jump on them. So this situation of continued sexual violence and the change in terms of the perpetrators being the people in Rakhine to the fellow, fellow Rakhine men, in, <coughs> fellow Rohingya men in the camps in Bangladesh. So this is a, a matter of great uh, distress for all of us. Um, all the women's organizations were working there as well as other humanitarian organizations. Um, there seems to be a lack of political will as well to try and put in the best effort to control the situation. Of course, lack of resources is always cited as the main reason why we can't do more. Bangladesh, when the Rohingyas first came in in August 2017, the first responders were the local people. And the local people actually welcomed the Rohingyas and provided them, shared their own food with them tried to provide them with as much as possible before the government or NGOs took over. The government was actually late in responding when the, across the, across the Naf River, when, the, when people could see the fire swirling up into the sky, it was the border guards who on their own decided to open the borders after dusk. Uh, um, after, just, after, after, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just could you start winding up? Could you take a little yeah, longer? Okay. okay. So I was going into too much description, I think. Anyway, these descriptions remain actually very strongly uh, etched in our minds. So it's hard not to talk about it. But um, the, in terms of the first responders, the government came in a bit late, but did its best in a way. I think the government estimation was that these people would stay maybe one year at the most. It is now over six years and uh, the crisis, uh, there is no a light at the end of the tunnel yet. And most people who are refugee experts say that this is a minimum 20 year, um, 20 year problem. In terms of Bangladeshi civil society, as I said initially, there was a lot of support, but gradually this support started eroding as the forest cover started eroding, as the local people began to see an erosion in resources for them that they had to share with the refugees, or that they saw that international agencies were coming in and giving a lot of resources to the refugees, whereas the people who were neighboring the camps, equally poor, if not poorer, not getting any of the resources that were coming in. So it created a tension between local people who euphemistically are called the host community. I don't know who invented that term because they were not invited by the local people. But anyway, so that was the situation. In terms of the civil society in, in Dhaka, in the capital, we tried to form uh, a local support group. And the first thing we did for the support group was to bring to the attention of the Bangladesh government, which is a member of the International Criminal Court, but Myanmar is not. So we had to find a way of bringing this under the jurisdiction of Bangladesh. So we had to use the, use the uh, provision for enforced deportation as a way of bringing the whole issue under Bangladesh's jurisdiction so that the ICC investigators could come 
to Bangladesh and use Bangladesh as a base to investigate and collect testimonies, etc. The other thing we did as a civil society group was to form the Bangladesh uh, network of civil society, Bangladesh civil society network for justice for the Rohingyas. And from, from this group, we actually prepared an amicus curie for the ICC and also followed up with the Gambian team, the Gambian legal team on the, uh, on the, on the proceedings at the ICJ at the International Court of Justice. So these are some of the ways in which we got involved. And in terms of continuing involvement, it has not been easy for us. My own organization is a small organization with little resources, but we are continuing to work in two camps with women survivors of sexual violence in helping them to bring, build leadership and, and find ways of fighting off threats that they face today inside the camps. Thank you, Kushi. Thank you, Shireen. Uh, uh, I hope I'm audible, yeah? Uh, am I audible? No? Just a minute. Yes, you're audible. You're audible. Okay, uh, Shireen, that thank you for giving such a extensive overview, which was really needed because to understand what the situation is on the ground, the kind of experience you've had your uh, right from the beginning till now, and the, at the different levels, right from the local level, at the level of the uh, refugees themselves, the local communities, nationally, as well as internationally, going up to the International Court of Justice, if possible. I think it has been uh, very important. And uh, the, you know, I think to give the actual situation of what is happening uh, totally was so important. We next have Dr. Sabangul Khatak. We move to Pakistan now where she will speak uh, about Afghanistan refugees. Uh, Sabagul Khatak is a member of the Planning Commission of Pakistan. She's a former executive director at the Sustainable Development Policy Institute in Islamabad uh, with a PhD in political science from the University of Hawaii. She has contributed significantly to the fields of comparative politics and feminist political theory. Dr. Khatak's work focuses on the political economy of development and state theory. She's an active member of various organizations, including the Women's Action Forum, who continue to remain so active and, uh, you know, is uh, for us uh, something that we look, look up to and get a lot of uh, energy from. Her research and writings encompass gender, public policies, governance, militarization, and refugee politics. She has written numerous papers and, contrib and has contributions to journals and books. So Saba, we would look we look forward to hearing you. And the floor is yours now. Again, I say five minutes, and we hope you can do it. If not, uh, sure we can extend a few minutes. Over to you. Thanks a lot. Um, I just want to correct, I was a member of the planning commission, no more. Uh, I'm right now an independent uh, researcher and happy to be one so I can speak my mind. Um, very quickly because I have only five minutes and uh, I don't know how I can do justice to the topic, but basically we all know Afghan refugees have been coming into Pakistan for 43 years since 1980 when initially um, you, uh, Soviet Union went into Afghanistan and, you know, the war, the Afghan Jihad started. I will cut a long story short and say that throughout the 43 years, the refugees who have come into Pakistan have been a result of different regime changes within Afghanistan. So, for instance, when the, when the uh, Mujahideen were fighting the Russians with the help of CIA and its uh, other allies, 
uh, it was people from rural areas, but after the Mujahideen takeover, the people who were associated with the Kabul government then fled into Pakistan. So very, very different sorts of refugees. Uh, in between, there were environmental refugees because of drought in Afghanistan when the Taliban took over Taliban 1.0, 1996 to 2001. Post 2001, a different group. So, and now, uh, you know, post August 2021, when the, after the Doha deal, uh, which was criminal, I think, especially for human rights, women's rights, after which gender apartheid has been imposed in Afghanistan, a lot of uh, new arrivals because Pakistan's government has not given them refugee status. And this is what is problematic today because as uh, the government is pushing out what it calls undocumented refugees, uh, many about six to 700,000 of these so-called undocumented refugees are actually what are termed new arrivals because they are being denied a refugee status. Uh, they are being pushed right back into Afghanistan, where they, which they fled due to fear of persecution. And there are other factors also. Some people thought, you know, uh, it may they may have a chance for resettlement in a third country, but really there are only 3,500 visas granted for that, which brings in the uh, international context and uh, context of responsibility. Uh, for wars that have been waged in a country uh, whose people are displaced, but no one is willing to take them. Uh, so Pakistan's policy and challenges are, of course, first of all, we have Pakistan, just like the rest of South Asia, has not signed any kind of uh, international convention, the Geneva Convention on Refugees, the 1967 Protocol, and it does not have, deliberately so, uh, any legislation or policy on refugees. Only this year was a refugee law proposed in the parliament, but no discussion took place on it, and, um, you know, the caretaker government replaced it soon after. Um, this is deliberate, of course, because then the country can use refugees as footballs between Afghanistan uh, and, of course, Pakistan, when Afghanistan's government is not, um, you know, doing things uh, the way the Pakistan government would like it to do, then the refugees are sent back. And this is not the first time, although this time uh, the deportation drive is very vicious, it has happened very regularly since 2001. Uh, under the Musharraf regime, and then again uh, after 2014-15, uh, and in between also small drives take place when, you know, there are ref refugee, Afghan refugee settlements, and some land mafia or the other wants to take over that land, so they're Houses are demolished and terrorism is claimed. And this time again, because just during this year, we've had about um, 1,100 um, deaths due to terrorist incidents, um, the Pakistan government has accused the Taliban of uh, allowing, t uh, you know, uh, Taliban to act against Pakistan from across the border. Uh, and there have been clashes uh, along the border with Afghanistan. Uh, now, to say maybe some refugees which is what the government is claiming were involved in uh, you know some of the terrorist attacks but to just deport everyone amounts to collective punishment and you know this is against international law find the people who were involved and punish them according to the constitution but to just blame an entire population for the crimes of someone, we still don't know, uh, you know, there are allegations. So, uh, you know, and to be giving them one month notice in which, of course, all refugees, those with uh, papers, legal papers have also been deported and are being deported. Um, 
On this, uh, there are two uh, other aspects that I want to talk about. One is, yes, there is a lack of a refugee law. That does not mean that we can completely say that there's no legality for refugees because Pakistan has signed instruments with UNHCR. It has signed the Convention on Torture. It has uh, the right to asylum cited in its constitution. There are judgments in Pakistan that are saying uh, asylum seekers have the right to claim uh, refugee status and the principle of you know um, uh, forced return uh, Pakistan has been upholding that but not anymore and of course Pakistan's government is saying these are illegal they are undocumented but the point is they want to be documented and those who don't want to be documented, yes, maybe that can be discussed separately, but to take on a position without discussing it with a caretaker government whose mandate it is not to take major policy decisions, the whole thing is problematic and being questioned by civil society and some political parties in Pakistan. For 22 years, the Pakistan government's attitude towards refugees has also, and the economic meltdown within the country, has also resulted in a lot of xenophobic responses, including from civil society. Um, and today we, we are also witnessing that within feminist circles as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we have limited time, so I just want to point to the main issues. In addition, I think UNHCR's role, of course, like it was said, UNHCR should do protection. But even for protection, UNHCR has maybe three protection officers in Pakistan or something like that. It has cut its funding by 46% in Pakistan, like what was allocated about $176 million, which is inadequate for 3 million people, 3 million plus. On top of that, this $176 million became $95.7 million. Overall, globally also, UNHCR has been cutting its, has had to cut it, its budgets, but also for Europe, it has reserved 16%. For the Middle East and North Africa, it is 23% and must increase now. We understand Gaza. Uh, but for all of the Asia Pacific, it has 9% of its global budget. So, you know, given this context, also given the context of the Doha deal that had four major points in which, of course, Afghan women were ignored, uh, international responsibility becomes very, very problematic. It is like they have completely neither UNHCR responds properly, nor does the international community. Look at the 3,500 visas at best that are available for Afghans for one year. There is a huge demand. There are many, many women, widows, others who have come to Pakistan in the hope of resettlement, but with 3,500 visas, with UNHCR not even giving out any figures, people are frustrated. They are waiting for a call from UNHCR uh, for two years, for one year. And, you know, they, this is not the kind of treatment a refugee agency should take. It should have a better communication policy in which it communicates to the people what its constraints are and what is happening. So it will not say anything like a big bureaucracy. Um, what are our um, um, recommendations very quickly? I hope I have a minute or two. Um, very quickly, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, well, of course, the first would be to have a refugee law and a policy that clearly states you cannot use refugees, which, of course, countries do, 
like a pol uh, political uh, football, uh, but one also would want UNHCR to take on a different role. One would want the international community to take responsibility and not be silent. It is like one person tweeted saying Afghanistan was sold for Ukraine and Ukraine is sold for Israel. So, you know, it, it's a very sort of apt way. It's very uh, much from the ground. Uh, another refugee was telling me, we thought we were hiding from the rain, but we found ourselves under the train uh, in Pakistan. Um, this is not how uh, we can treat refugees. The first recommendation, of course, is to balance security concerns with humanitarian concerns. Security concerns cannot trump humanitarian concerns. And the government has to understand that uh, on laws, yes, our courts have given very pro-refugee state uh, judgments. There are judgments that we have and that we have also used to petition the National Human Rights Commission, which is sympathetic, to petition the National uh, Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, there are sympathetic voices within government, so the government is not some big monolith. Uh, there are sympathetic people within government that we are trying as civil society to lobby with. Uh, there are a number of uh, you know, issues, but I think also on GBV, uh, gender-based violence, I want to bring that up because that is one of the most ignored, underfunded issue and not just underfunded, but also with very little human resource. So, um, so that sort of prevents women's voices, women refugees' voices from coming to the center. Uh, there's a lot of mental health issues that need to be addressed. There are also um, issues around other forms uh, of sexual violence that need to be addressed, but everyone is mum about it. We all know it happens, but no one talks about it. All of this can be addressed effectively through the laws of Pakistan, provided we can take on a, a more systematic approach to these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Saba, and for giving the overview, bringing in the issue of the UN bodies, especially UNHCR and international organizations, institutions, and countries, uh, the global politics that exists. And at the end, it's the refugee who's fleeing for her life that is the one who's most uh, vulnerable. So uh, I uh, just want to thank you. Uh, I want to now introduce Razia Sultana. Razia Sultana is a dedicated lawyer, educator, and human rights activist, focusing on supporting Rohingya girls and women. Uh, Razia herself is a Rohingya woman. She's published influential reports, including Two I'll mention here. One is Witness to Horror, which has created ripples, and Rape by Command, exposing sexual violence by Burmese security forces. Razia currently coordinates the Free Rohingya Coalition and directs the Arakan Rohingya National Organization Women's Section, advocating for justice and gender equality. As a woman from a Rohingya background, she has made her mark globally in ensuring and keeping the issue alive time and time again, and in focus at every level of international fora that she has access to and goes over. So Razia, thank you so much for joining us and accepting our invitation. Uh, you have the experience, the, right from the personal experience, so again, I'm sorry we have such short time, but five minutes. Over to you, Razia. Thank you so much. I don't want to share my little bit. Uh, I'm Razia Sultana, uh, based in uh, Bangladesh, and I live in Chittagong. I brought up in Bangladesh. My parents, they are 60s migrant uh, before uh, Bangladesh independent. Anyhow, uh, I think uh, in this moment, um, I think my father, my grandfather, and even my uncle, they didn't face uh, the challenge about their identity, but now I am facing uh, my identity problems. 
because of my work, because I'm working in a uh, camp, uh, also host community, I'm working for women, especially um, I am focused on the psychosocial. And I run a psychosocial from 2018. I form a women organization which registered uh, in Bangladesh only. Um, uh, so one thing, uh, the question arises that how our Rohingya uh, women can uh, create an uh, organization in Bangladesh. So I have to prove that I am a legal citizen. Anyhow, it is challenge. I have to overcome this and I'm trying to do this. And uh, I know uh, the Bangladesh people, I am also a Bangladeshi, but my roots, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a very big question. And um, we need more support, uh, especially civil society. Now, uh, some conflict, uh, it is, uh, maybe it's not that much, but slowly it's now started because the yellow media, they focus in this Rohingya, uh, they expose that, uh, not expose, introduce the uh, Rohingya as a criminal, no. One person can be criminal, but whole nation cannot be uh, criminal. So this way, uh, we have to prevent this uh, thing with the civil society also in the political level. And another issue is five years is gone, six years. There is a no forward about the education inside in the camp. And uh, there is no proper uh, education system inside in camp. Six years is a long day and uh, 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 a young uh, young people can uh, build up their uh, uh, they can establish within the six year but these people stuck we have a 40000 uh, secondary level uh, youth who are rooming around in the camp those who don't have any opportunity about the work and you know there are uh, no uh, you know no uh, no rule about the uh, the any vacancy or they uh, Rohingya also uh, hire as a volunteer. And uh, we see uh, after the COVID, uh, most of the organization is gone. Only few organization is still exist in uh, Cox's Bazaar. Yes, uh, ING is here, few. Uh, UN is there, uh, but work is uh, slowly, um, um, it's go uh, almost is gone uh, and uh, compared to the women and uh, because uh, some local organizations we uh, focus on women issue too much so there are uh, some uh, uh, level because uh, women are getting especially uh, I, I working in the camp 14 with the women when I recruit the women and I choose the volunteer men are always arguing with us so uh, this is very uh, sensitive issue and uh, we try to involve them, but uh, our program, our project, uh, it's not like that we, uh, they just uh, made uh, like, uh, we have to improve the woman uh, empowerment or woman leadership, but without men, uh, uh, the camp situation is a patriarchal and men dominate. Rohingya um, is, a, is a male dominate uh, society also very, conservative and uh, women are not allowed to be higher education, even not uh, allowed to be go outside. But one thing I can say uh, in, uh, in the sixth year, we grow some uh, awareness that women have a right to know and have a right to um, ask uh, um, and tell their own um, concern. So this thing is going on, but very literally. And another issue, the repatriation is uh, like uh, uh, just um, uh, just a topic. We didn't uh, see any progressive. Uh, even the when diplomat, uh, Myanmar diplomat came and Bangladeshi politician. They actually, when I feel it, there is no strong conversation because the people who are in the table they don't know what what is Rohingya history. Our, um, my experience, our own uh, uh, foreign minister, when I asked for the school, he asked, uh, he, he told me who will teach them. I say, we have some youth so we can run a school. Oh, you have the educated. So this, this concept, they have a uh, you know, negative mind against the Rohingya. So how can they solve the solution? Because negativity always in their mind. 
and uh, uh, they always focus that uh, Rohingya are yes they are burdened because um, they are forcefully displaced uh, displaced from their own motherland and we are not giving any opportunity to working or education even the movement restrict uh, they cannot move in one camp to another room um, i always advocate about uh, to uh, limited way we can give some opportunity about the education also livelihood inside the camp there is one million yes more than one million people they can they can do something inside the camp i'm not this for the forever but the time being they have to be independent and uh, the aid now the 12 dollar to 8 dollar now hardly 6 dollar how can they survive they become a beggar and uh, their children have no future there are even uh, three months ago our self uh, self school um, rohingya running self school is shut down and uh, it, it is very uh, purposely is shut down because um, of uh, some organization or educational program. Yes, I we saw so, so many um, uh, educational center in the camp, but there is no education. Only children come and do rhymes, no writing, only coloring, only rhymes. And uh, uh, we always asking about the Burmese curriculum and uh, some, uh, they made some uh, Burmese curriculum, but this is not a Burmese curriculum and Burmese curriculum need Burm uh, Rohingya teacher, but they are not choosing the Rohingya teacher. For the show up, they are uh, give some uh, uh, Rohingya assistant teacher who don't uh, pass the three level also. So they have the huge amount of, we have the teacher inside but they are not getting the opportunity without them we cannot run the burmese curriculum so the educational system is totally a show up there is no education and another issue is the trafficking because of the environment camp environment about uh, the program and also uh, the criminal activity drug dealing um, uh, people uh, um, people are, uh, feel unsecured and, um, especially um, young uh, girls and uh, young men for the better life, they jump in the sea every day. We are hearing this, uh, um, there are uh, uh, so many, but whatever, when they are try to be past the sea, none of the Asian Pacific, ASEAN country or another, no one they accept them except the Bangladesh. Yes, still Bangladesh, um, for my experience, Bangladesh never push them. Whatever they have, they try to protect them. They, yes, they are in the camp, but they never push them. But I see the Indonesia, the Malaysia, the India, whatever they do, they don't accept these people. They are not going for um, asking uh, for uh, aid or anything. For survival, they are uh, jumping the sea. And um, international level issue, we have a three trophy. ICJ, ICC, and IIIM. What purpose? We don't get any solution. Nothing is there. Even um, um, when we ask for, uh, this is a very uh, complicated. Is this complicated because you, are, you don't want to see this? Because you don't want to analyze this. And um, uh, I don't have faith in the UN or ASEAN because they are just uh, technically about this uh, the Rohingya issue. Rohingya are not uh, uh, maybe first class, second class, or even not a number nine, because everywhere they are discriminated. Even when uh, the third resettlement, you know, for the um, uh, Malaysia or Indonesia, forget about the Bangladesh. Last year, only 80 people, 8080 people. If this, uh, this kind of people they are taking, we, they need 200 years. So, this is not going to work. Third settlement. Yeah, I have then, to ask you to uh, okay. shorten it a bit. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And that that is my uh, one, one thing. One thing I will say. Forget about the uh, third resettlement. Better to and take to our youth. Uh, <laughs> better to take our youth and give them opportunity about the education. Education and. Uh, 
We have this strong political uh, conversation with Myanmar, especially, um, yes, Bangladesh is there. We need more support from international community, but I know uh, this is uh, only can do when we all together can push. Thank you so much. I think. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Razia. That was very useful to listen to the ground situation. It seems there are a lot of uh, parallels, a lot of between what was said before. Uh, I know the situation in Bangladesh is not ideal. Uh, even in Bangladesh, uh, the funds have gone down considerably uh, from what they were getting for, as aid for the refugees. So we, uh, we move to the next speaker now. I think uh, as we hear everybody and then when we hear everyone together, a lot of things are beginning to fall in place that no matter where, whichever country it is, the issues, the concern, the kind of questions of security and dignity are absolutely essential. So uh, I would now like to go to our last speaker, but she's certainly not the least. We have Dr. Seema Samal, a physician, renowned humanitarian and a diplomat from Afghanistan. She's a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Internal Displacement and the High Level Advisory Board on Mediation. Dr. Samal has a history of significant public service, including roles as Special Envoy of the President of Afghanistan at one point. She was the State Minister for Human Rights and International Affairs at one point, and the Chairperson of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. A staunch advocate for women's rights, she has received numerous international awards, including the Ramon Magdisaise Award and the Jonathan Mann Award for Global Health and Human Rights. Seema Samar is also the founder of the Gawa, Go Harshad Institute of Higher Education, and she's also a co group, group member of Sangat along with me. So, Seema, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Hushi. Uh, it's good to see all of our sisters and brothers who are really concerned about the situation in our region. Uh, first of all, I would like to send my deepest solidarity uh, and sympathy to the people in, in Middle East, to the civilian who are losing their life because of the aggression, because of lack of accountability. And also my deepest solidarity with Bangladeshi colleagues because of uh, the loss of our champion on on environment it's for all i mean he was for all of us not only for bangladesh but it was a global champion on uh, environment and i also would like to thank the pakistani people and pakistan government for some of uh, i mean mainly the pakistani people for their patience in hosting afghan refugees for so many years for 45 years uh, i have been uh, refugee myself for 17 years in Pakistan from uh, 1994 until 2001. And I become refugee again uh, for second time. Uh, so a forced refugee. The reason I'm saying this is that it's very difficult to leave whatever you have behind, even if you have a muddy house, if you have a small space to to put your tent, it's your own country. So people will not uh, choose to become refugee and to go to another country uh, for enjoyment. I mean, they could go for enjoyment, but not as refugee. So it is really, really difficult. As, as Sabah nicely put it, we are refugees of different regime in the country from the invasion of the Russian, to the invasion of the, the Americans and also to the current regime in Afghanistan. And I keep saying that the Afghan people are unfortunately hostage between the 
extreme left, which was USSR and the Khalqis in Parchamese in Afghanistan, and also extreme right, which is, which is Taliban. So I think <clears throat> refugees, not only, I mean, we had a lot of problems, but uh, the recent action by the um, Pakistani government, I don't know why is this time, uh, is uh, some kind of a surprise for all of us. And as uh, I don't know, I think more than three million refugees, Afghan refugees, are living in in Pakistan. Maybe same or uh, same number living in Iran. So people are really leaving the country in order to escape the violation, escape the prosecution, uh, to survive to uh, to Pakistan or to other countries. But I think always refugees, either if it's Rohingyas or Afghans or now the new refugees of Palestine, should not be seen as a, as a problem. They should be seen as an opportunity. They could be used in a proper way, in a in a very positive way, in in the country. So what has happened, unfortunately, in in uh, the refugee camps? I mean, we. I don't want to repeat what we the problem and challenges that we have. One of the issues that Mr. Nair put in, also our sister um, Razia Sultana from uh, Rohingya um, uh, people, is that the importance of education. The education was ignored in Afghan, for Afghan refugees for so many years. And that's why this uh, we were stuck in madrasas, all these children who were born because women did not have access to reproductive rights, which is another important really aspect. And I hope that the people really pay attention to that, that issue. And of course, more children, no possibility for education. They were attracted to madrasas and we have the current Taliban Pakistani Taliban and Afghan Taliban is the result of those madrasas and the outcome of those madrasas. By the way, it's not only limited to Afghan and Pakistan, it's Bangladeshis and also Igors, who you name it from different Islamic countries were on those madrasas, which was built actually for Afghan refugees, but um, it spread to the other uh, Muslim countries as well. The second point that I would like to mention that Again, the women access to reproductive rights and particularly to contraception. Imagine how much um, the number of the children increased and how much violence, domestic violence, and also different sexual violence in the camps and also in the refugee settlement increased with that. The boys are end up to the madrasas, to the different gang groups, the smugglers, the drug smugglers, the looters, the, the thieves, and the weapon smugglers, uh, and also in those madrasas. Joining those, those uh, different uh, radical groups under the name of jihad and using our religion in order to fight for, for power, not for uh, real Islam. And girls end up with this child marriage. And then what? If the girl are mar married in, on age of eight, 14, then the reproductive time of her life is up to 50 years. So if there's education, at least they will marry later. They will marry at the age of 28 or 29 or 30. The, the reproductive age is, is limited practically and, and normally, which also help with the reduction of the population. And then the girls, the child girl are forced to, to marry to elderly men or sold to, to feed the rest of the family. So girls are more vulnerable to those kind of, uh, of, of violation of human rights. So I think that is uh, these two issues, health and education is really important. And I don't know with the current situation, I, I assume or I think that the, because of the Taliban is not support, is, is cooperating with the Pakistani government in order to hand over the Pakistani Taliban 
to the Pakistan government. That's why they did not recognize, although Pakistan was the first country who recognized the Taliban first regime in 1990s. And the, if that is the case or what, and particularly that regime, that Taliban regime, which is unfortunately, uh, again, it's not Pakistani people, it's the Pakistan government who supported the Taliban as a proxy for against the, the whatever a problem that we had, uh, is, is a problem in the region. I, I'm not denying that. Unfortunately, this regime, as we all call it, they impose apartheid, gender apartheid on all female um, population of the country. The only country who doesn't have a constitution, the only country who has official ban on education. Imagine education is the basic tool for empowerment. Education is the basic tool for development. Education is the basic tool, particularly for sustainable peace. And we don't have all those. No proper education. I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that we will have generation of, of uh, Taliban for uh, years to come. And for the girls, uh, they do not allow them to go to get education. And why? Of course, because they are empowered and they cannot control them. And it's easy to control half of the population and then use the, the religion and, and the tradition and culture in order to uh, subordinate them. And and, and if, if half of the population, female member of the families, or inferior than the male member of the family. That itself, the, the conflict starts within the family. The discrimination starts within the family. That kind of same mentality goes to the street, go to the school, go to the society, and the conflict continues. In conflict in Afghanistan will not stay in, the, in our own boundary wall. We know our, our neighboring countries are affected and impacted by those. My final point would say, I would say wherever there's human, there's a crimes, unfortunately, in a very advanced country, a rich country, or in very poor country. So they might be criminal among the Afghan refugees, but the collective punishment is not the right way. So uh, the, the people should be treated with dignity as a human being, and it's also very difficult to distinguish between most of the uh, people between Afghanistan and Pakistan, because we have a lot of Pakistani Taliban who has Afghan identity, and we have a lot of Afghans who has Pakistani identity. So that is the because of the ethnicity in the border between the two countries. So I think it should be uh, voluntary based, and it should be respect for human dignity and human rights because we don't know where we go. And that is the sad part. And the international community, I think, as, as previous speaker already said, um, Afghan or Afghanistan was forgotten because of Ukraine, and now Ukraine is partially forgotten because of the Gaza and because of the Israel and Palestine problem. And we don't know which other problems will arise. And we we see that the conflict is is increasing in you in, in African countries and some other Muslim countries, unfortunately. But we, as a civil society, we have to stand up together and fight for all these. And I would like again to thank the Pakistani women and activists who had the demonstration in support of Afghan refugees, and also the Pakistani Human Rights Commission who released a statement in support of the uh, Afghan refugees in Pakistan. The final word and the final sentence that I would like to say, people will take the memories, good memories and bad memories with them. And it's really, really good to have good memories from the host countries. At the end of the day, we are all human. The borderline was built would, was draw by somebody in order to divide us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Seema. Uh, what you said is we are all humans and we should 
remember and recognize that we are all humans. You've also said that, you know, they, some individuals, and this is something that Razia had also mentioned, some individuals may be engaged in, or probably are sometimes engaged in criminal activities, which is happening in every country, every nation, every place, every, I mean, whether you're a refugee or not a refugee, you have criminals everywhere. That doesn't mean you penalize the entire community of refugees by saying refugees are criminals. I think that's an important point you brought out and the issue of human dignity and human rights to be is something that has echoed throughout with everybody. I would like to now open the, I would like to thank all the speakers once again. Uh, Shireen had to leave because she's really not well. She was just out of the hospital a few days back. She's not well, but she thought the issue was so important that she needed to come and talk. Uh, I thank her for having done that, but I don't want to push her to stay on for longer and then get ill again and be hospitalized. So, but all the rest are here with us still. And I'd like to now open the floor for our panelists to engage and exchange their thoughts amongst each other in response to what they have heard, and then open up the floor to the audience for any questions. So uh, I think first I'd ask our uh, speakers if they would like to add something, ask a question, uh, feel that there is something that resonates with what they have said or their experience or their views and thoughts. So, and then I would open up the floor. I know there are a few of you who have sent questions in the Zoom chat, and I would like you all to continue to do that. And I will then call upon you. And when I do call upon you, please unmute your microphone and ask or speak. So yes, amongst the four of you, if any of you are wanting to say something, exchange, engage, the floor is yours. Anyone? Pushy, can I? Seema yes, wants please. to say something. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I think what is really important, I just wanted to mention one point uh, uh, in relation to Rohingyas. When I was the chairperson of Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, we had the Bangladesh Human Rights Commission and also the um, Myanmar Human Rights Commission. And the sad part is that the chairperson of the Myanmar um, Human Rights Commission said that we do not recognize people or issues such as Rohingyas. But my, because I was chairing that, that session and I, I said, I'm so sorry to hear this from a chairperson of the Human Rights Commission. You like it or not, it does exist. It's almost a million of people who are displaced. And okay, maybe 10 people or 20 people or 100 people choose to come to Bangladesh, but not 1 million. I live in a country with conflict. So I think no one can be free from violence or conflict. We don't know who is who. Uh, and, and and that's why I, th I think it's really important to lobby for putting the human dignity and human rights in front of everybody. Thanks, Seema. Does anyone else want to come in at this stage? Menaz has a hand up. Yeah, Rehman has a hand up. Who's, sorry, Menaz, yeah. But I thought first we'd have our speakers and then I'd open the floor for Manas and others. Uh, would as Razia, Saba or Ravi have anything to add or to say anything? Yeah, Saba. Um, I was quickly go, going over the comments and I saw that some people are asking why is the caretaker government taking this action right now of deporting the so-called undocumented refugees. I just want to make a short answer so that 
you know, if there are other questions, those can uh, people can respond. Like uh, Seema Bibi said, um, you know, when the Pakistan government is unhappy with right now the Taliban government, then uh, it will pressure the Taliban government by sending back refugees. This is neither, it's very cold, it's a tough situation, but Pakistan is sending them back. Uh, it's to pressure the Taliban government, talking about security, that there has been issues. What uh, Seema Bibi had said uh, is exactly the case. It is the politics between the two countries of TTP having safe havens, who then came into Chetral and other parts of Pakistan. Uh, there was bombing along the border also. Um, and it is really uh, refugees become the 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 victims of these politics so just so it's out there thank you thank you ravi or uh, razia and do you all have anything to say or shall we move on to the questions that people have raised mm. uh, one thing uh, when anything is yeah we've lost razia she was trying to talk yeah, we've lost Razia and we've lost um, Ravi as well. Ravi is not okay. on. So maybe uh, um, go to those who raise their hands. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lalita, Lali, do you want to, did you want to say something? You said you were going to be leaving. I know Fozia has a hand up, but a few people had their hands up before. Fozia, do you want to come in? Menaz had her hand up much earlier. Okay, so Menaz. Okay. I don't Sorry, answer. I had written that in chat and Baba has already answered my question because yeah. I was really uh, surprised why this caretaker government has taken this sudden uh, decision to deport them. I mean, so maybe this is because of Taliban of, I mean, I mean, Sabah has responded to what I wanted to ask. Okay. Can I just add a word that uh, Mehnaz, we know that the caretaker government, how many decision it, <laughs> decisions it takes and who actually takes the decisions. True. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> so we have okay. the Fozia, Suraj, <laughs> after that, yes. and after that, after that. After yeah, wonderful eye-opening, mind-boggling discussion today. Thank you so much, the panelists. And uh, to Dr. Seema, uh, Salam to Dr. Seema. Uh, met her in Quetta long ago in Mariabad. So Dr. Sal, uh, my question to you is, uh, uh, what are the uh, expatriate Afghanis like yourself? Like uh, you are a symbol of those who have been a refugee, been outside, now you're outside. And uh, there are many people like you who are fortunate enough to be outside, but you also have links with the Pakistan government because of living 17 years in Pakistan. Now the a big issue about the refugees is uh, one, that they are being deported, which is, should not be an issue because that's the law. If you are uh, illegal, you get deported. That's the problem everywhere. But even legal ones, those who have a refugee card, who have, those who are there with the consent and the agreement of the government are also being deported. So, uh, uh, there, I see that there's a kind of a edge or a, a, a power or strength for our, in the hands of the Afghans who are outside Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Speaking from the West, it does make an impact. Is there any such forum of Afghanis who are outside can talk about for the rights of their own Afghani people in Pakistan? Because Pakistanis are not doing much. You see, Aurat March is a big thing, but where are the men march? Where are the other? I don't see many people talking for them. So, it's, madam. Question to you. Should I, should I answer, yes, Kushi? Yeah. yeah, I think uh, we, uh, let me put it this way, the, let's say, intellectual or activists, we were pushed out, not by, again, by choice, but by, by force. And we were stuck with our own problems ourselves. But we had, we, we have a network and we were working on this. I think one of the issues that we can, uh, we can push uh, through the human rights, the OSHR office, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and also through UNICEF. Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, the people which I knew, which was in the Pakistan government, is not there anymore. I mean, I have my friends. <laughs> Uh, Power is uh, the one I know her from 1990s, Shirkat Gao, or some Aurat, friends from Aurat Foundation and so on. And somehow we we lost Asma, unfortunately. Sometimes he now doesn't respond to our email. But we try, actually, uh, from our side. We had a statement. We I think we still can ask some of the countries to maybe to promise uh, pakistan some some aid some pro some some financial support in order to let the afghans stay in pakistan so we try our best but we are also you know we we are also broken i would say this way i put it this way it's very very difficult to explain in words and make it i mean to make the sentence how we feel uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm in the U.S., the life is easier, but I miss my own country. It's when I was in Pakistan, we were so close to uh, Afghanistan, so it was easy to go and come back. And it, I was dealing always with the Afghan refugees, so I was not feeling that I'm a refugee. But here, I'm, I'm so isolated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suraj, if you do not mind, we have uh, we have Razia Sultana back as well as Ravi, and I'm worried that we lose them again. So Razia had begun speaking. Maybe Razia, you just finish what you were saying, and then I'll ask Ravi, and then I'll come to you, Suraj. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's uh, only my concern. Not. Uh, it's like a, uh, when we talk, we always try to blame the Bangladesh system, but rather than to uh, blame the Bangladesh, we have to focus on the international level and also the Myanmar business thing. Because none of the country, even the international, even the UAE, even the ASEAN, they are not stopped um, uh, doing business with this country. And another issue, after the influx, okay, uh, people uh, say this is Rohingya, they are not belong uh, with Myanmar, but the land is uh, uh, actually, uh, the Arakan is a separate land and if anyone search uh, the history you can find this but because this issue is not focused and not taken seriously now the coup again and whole Myanmar is citizen are under threat and the most of the activists now they are out of the country so now they are understanding. So this is the time we have to be um, uh, forward. How can we convince and how can we re, um, uh, re spread our um, history? Because they brainwash from decade. It's not a simple thing because uh, from 70 years, uh, the Myanmar government, yes, that time is a Burma, they just give a wrong message to the Myanmar citizen and Myanmar people that uh, Rohingya are not belong to Myanmar. But they never uh, uh, told or not telling this. Arkan is not the, it was not the part of the uh, Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar. It was in bed and there is history. We have to be share everyone. So this is my uh, concern and also request when you are talking in some uh, platform, you have to be uh, stand with the Rohingya because we are not stateless and a stateless word is not for us. We are belong in the Arakan and Arakan is now is a part of the Myanmar, but it is uh, itself, it was independent. So there is a people and the people we are, Rakhine and Rohingya. So that is my concern. Thank you so much. Thank you, Razia. That was very important that how uh, borders and countries are dictated to and determined unilaterally by somebody who doesn't even belong to that place. Ravi, do you want to add something, say something? Is there something you want to just bring in? You have to unmute yourself. The only point that I would like to underline is the long in the long term in South Asia, it's public education on refugee rights and refugee problems and creating an atmosphere of empathy and creating uh, the sinews for the creation of national legislation. If you are dependent on 
international donor assistance or the international uh, uh, legal systems alone to help you, then you are asking for the moon. Thank you. Thank you. That's an important part that's brought up. Uh, I'd like to now really ask Suraj, who has been very patient, to take the floor. Please unmute yourself. Thank you, Kusiti, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Well, first, I would like to keep my remark on, you know, Bhutanese refugee, and I'll have one question at the end. Um, I concur with host uh, Namartaji's evaluation of the corruption and involvement of high-ranking government officials in a fraudulent scheme. This scheme involves around Nepali nationals uh, impersonating Buddhist refugee to facilitate their resettlement in the United States. The exposure of this fake uh, Buddhist refugee scam has sent shockwaves throughout Nepal and globally, laying bare a complex network of corruption and deceit involving in influential figures within the country's political landscape. As a former Bhutanese refugee who now resides in the United States, I am very much disheartened by the corruption and has marred the plight and suffering of Bhutanese refugee. It is astonishing that amid this serious corruption that has brought global shame to the government of Nepal, there seems to have been little discussion or action taken to address the root causes that create an environment conducive to corruption. On the different note, I have heard uh, one of the speakers previously discussed about the successful resettlement of the Buddhist refugee. I have a different perspective on this uh, notion. Well, I agree that, uh, that refugee resettlement is often referred to as durable solution. In my view, it, it primarily addresses short-term goals by transplanting or relocating the issues rather than finding a permanent solution. When we talk about Buddhist refugees uh, issue, their resettlement in the United States has given rise to the highest level of mental health issues compared to the other ethnic communities, ethnic minorities in the United States. They have been separated from their loved ones since 1990s, unable to reunite with their parents and siblings, even in the event of their parents' funerals. Dozens of political prisoners remain incarcerated in the Buddhist prisons, many serving life sentences, and their residual families members cannot communicate or even visit them. Well, the global community may perceive the issues as resolved, the root causes persist. In my perspective, resettlement may achieve certain goals, but it falls short in addressing the underlying problems that continue to exist. Finally, my question to you know, speakers are, is, what are the reasons behind the reluctance of several Asian countries to sign international refugee protocols and covenants? Does anyone of the panelists want to respond to that? Uh, that's, yeah, Ravi, go ahead. I will be a little frank. Um, I think uh, resettlement was not forced on anybody in the camps in, in Jhapa or Beldangi. Uh, resettlement was an option. Some brave Bhutanese refugees, like the head of Europe, the human rights organization of Bhutan, chose to stay back. Others, uh, for good reason, uh, decided to start a new life elsewhere in different countries. So one mustn't talk uh, disparagingly of resettlement as such. You are absolutely right on the issue that the root causes were never addressed. And uh, that uh, is a major failure of the international community and the regional community and more so of India, which played uh, an unfortunate uh, uh, role in the whole Bhutanese refugee crisis. I, I know this problem very well because I dealt with the Nepalese government at the highest level, at the foreign secretary level. I was the first person to do an early warning system because I was thrown out of Bhutan when the first protest started by the ethnic Nepalese and the Sachots in Gelafug 
uh, area in um, in Bhutan, and I was handed over to the Indian police by the Bhutanese police, uh, being thrown out, ejected out of the country. So I, I be if you, uh, uh, I've I've continued to follow the situation there, and the large number of uh, Bhutanese. Uh, uh, prisoners still uh, in jails in Bhutan of ethnic Nepal ethnicity. And uh, one is concerned about it, but Nepal's present leadership is, to put it uh, mildly, inept uh, uh, in more ways than one. And uh, it would require major heavy lifting on the part of uh, European states which are, have very good relations with Bhutan and most importantly, India, and which is uh, unwilling to do anything given the very sensitivity of the new Bhutan-China relationship and its impact on India's borders. I won't say more, but if you want to uh, read more on this, go to the leaflet.com uh, and read some of my pieces on the whole Bhutan imbroglio. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was shared that Tareen had asked a question in the chat about how is refugee resettlement a feminist cause? Does anyone, and it need not be only the people who are the speakers, but anybody can jump in and see the link between why it is a feminist cause. And without us actually, wanting it that way or trying to make it that way, we somehow, the names that we came up with and each one of us who were the organizers were giving names, came up with all, all women's names in, as our speakers. Uh, that was not intentional, it just happened. But that brought me to the question that was raised just now. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, does anyone want to respond to that or? Shall we just let it pass? No, we would like to hear from Ravi, please. Okay. Ravi, you're very popular. Go ahead. <laughs> I, the case of processing of the uh, Afghan refugees uh, for resettlement in Pakistan is a case in point how gender injustice is done to women and children. Almost all the Western countries prefer an intake of males, uh, adult, able-bodied males for their workforce, for their militarization programs. Women and children in that whole process in Pakistan, uh, run by the embassies and UNFCR, get short shrift. Uh, this is something that can be looked at in other resettlement programs elsewhere too. I am aware of these problems in India too. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, too familiar with what's happening in Bangladesh, but I don't think it's any different. I think women and children always get shroff ship because the uh, resettlement countries see you as burdens rather than equal uh, partners in the building of new societies. Thank you. Yeah, it's also a question of, uh, yeah, Seema, go ahead. Yeah, Seema. go ahead, you finish your sentence, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying that it's also the mindset of thinking that the male is the head of the family and that a female cannot live or exist without a male uh, you know, head over, over her or the family. And so it's a very male dominated and oriented perception. Yeah, I have uh, two more hands, Seema, you finish and then I'll ask yeah, Rani. I'm Rani, why don't you go ahead? My, own, my question was slightly different. I just wanted to know, from among the refugees, some may want asylum. How do you differentiate asylum seekers? I'm saying because I've had a case where I tried to pursue an asylum of a, of a young woman from Balochistan with, with the family sort of divided. So. I mean, maybe Ravi or somebody who knows more about these rules and regulations can tell us, you know, there are there are refugees who need to be treated with safety and security, but within them, there are people who are asylum seekers. So how how is that dealt with in, in the through the procedures and process? 
maybe okay. Ravi can talk, tell us about some, or Seema, somebody who's got experience. Yeah, I just this. respond to the first, the, the question before. Um, I think it's a, it's a feminist issue because uh, currently, particularly during or during the war in Afghanistan, it was always male business, so women were not important. But in current situation with the, the new Taliban government or the second round of Taliban government, it's completely agenda apartheid. So it is a feminist um, cause that we have to uh, to save them. Uh, one other point that I forgot that uh, in the in the whole issue of uh, different ethnic in Afghanistan, the Hazaras as a minority are attacked every day. Last week we had a suicide attack in the mosque and then another one, another explosion three days ago in a sport club again. So that in most of these girls who were in the police or who were in the army were the Hazara girls because they are more open to civilization and they are under attack. So it's, it is a feminist kind of a, uh, an issue, the whole refugee. Thank you. So anyone wants to respond to Howard, or do you think? Yeah, Ravi again, yeah. Just to give you a uh, rundown on what procedure is under national or international law. When you cross an international border, you are a refugee in principle. However, you have to go through a refugee status determination before you actually declare a refugee in law. Once which is, you why, which is why somebody is saying documented and undocumented, right? Yeah, that's right. Once you uh, register as a refugee with the national authorities or UNHCR, as the case may be, you become an asylum seeker formally. That is, the most of those in Pakistan at the moment, the new arrivals are to 21, have been undocumented. And as Dr. Khatak very rightly mentioned, uh, it's because of the complete inefficiency of UNHCR in uh, Pakistan to have uh, such a minimal support structure to run the refugee status determination and the Pakistan government just not having the machinery to really uh, supplement or supplant it. Thank you. Yamanuri, you've put in a no and a cross. You don't want to ask the question again, or you've withdrawn. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, there were many questions, so that's why I wanted to wait until Have my turn comes. One come. that you think I... is most important. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can yes. hear you. Uh, I am Yamo, uh, a freelance journalist from Kabul. Uh, partially living in Pakistan, uh, but mostly based uh, and working in Afghanistan. I have a question about this quick, uh, about, about uh, the Pakistani decisions on uh, returning the refugees from Pakistan, which I think they will start on 1st of November. Uh, from the panelists, and uh, specifically from Dr. Seb Simo, uh, if, do we have any quick solution right now? Because in few days, the Pakistani government are starting um, uh, putting back the, the Afghans uh, through Thorkhan border back to Afghanistan, especially the one who were not registered. Uh, uh, if you guys have had any research or um, as this is mostly you've already explained a lot about it, uh, if there would be any quick solution right now for either delaying it or uh, any activist groups or uh, feminists uh, to 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 delay or or stop this this uh, action? Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, what I don't know if you were there right from the beginning, but we did begin with how there have been uh, even today uh, demonstrations and large demonstrations against this decision to send people back. The most we can do is keep on raising it, having demonstrations, actively participating and actively being on the streets and uh, negotiating as much as we can, but it is up to the government. Uh, I'm sure we can continue this conversation for many, many more hours. This has been an extremely uh, 
I think a educative session for all of us. We just blanketly, just uh, in a blanket term, just push refugees as one category. And I think today's uh, discussions brought in the, you know, the differences that exist, the sensitivity that we need to deal with, the main issue of being of human dignity and human rights, uh, of safety, of be, being of crucial. Those are the three issues I think that, ha that are non-negotiable and that is what we think that we want everyone who comes in for refuge is given that. And unfortunately, that's not the case as we've heard from everybody. The con conversation can continue. The issues should not be finished just today. This is just something that we have opened up. It's not that we are the first people who started talking about it. Others have previous to us also. But in Sapan, this is, we've opened this up today. And we want to continue, like each one of us can keep on writing to each other, raising the issues and raising it within our own work. So I'd like to um, end the session over here now. Uh, I will not try and summarize the discussion. I'll just, the I don't want to give any closing remarks too, because I just think we've had an excellent, and I want to thank everyone. We've had an excellent uh, discussion. It, it op certainly opened up my mind in many ways. And I've always thought I've been open and I've been aware and I've been very conscious. But when you hear people speak about it passionately because that's what their life and their work has been, it just changes you. So I'll end now. I thank you all for having cooperated yeah. with me so well. And I'll hand it back to you, Namrata. It's uh, yours uh, now for the ending part. Namrata. Namrata, you're muted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought I had. Um, thank you, Kushi, uh, for moderating this uh, very, very important discussion in such a lovely way. And this is something Sapan feels very strongly about and would like to facilitate taking forward to widespread impact in the region. That's what SAPAN exists for. And this is a very, very important issue for the people of the region. I'd like to uh, request all the panelists and volunteers to turn on the video camera so we can take a virtual group photo. But just before doing that, I actually want to really thank everybody for the excellent presentation that they made and also the issues that have come up, like Suraj has said that following up on uh, the refugee issues that has come up, we can actually have different uh, webinars in the future too. So um, I'd like to request everybody to kindly put on your videos on, which uh, this is another thing Sapan does in the webinars to capture our picture. And before we close, a quick request to all of you to please contribute using the link in the chat. Kindly share the link, uh, the SAPAN team will do that, to make a tax deductible donation. Our work at SAPAN is entirely volunteer driven. Someone on our team will be putting the link up. They're probably doing it now uh, in the chat box. Thanks again. A huge thank you to everyone who made this event possible. And to all of you watching too, because the viewers are very, very important to us. Besides, those who you saw on the screen today are many volunteers without whom we couldn't have done this webinar. Special thanks goes to Sapan volunteers, Sarita Bortola, Vishal Sharma, Ekta Kapoor, Bina Sarwar, Khawar Mumtaz, Shailaja Rao, Sarah Arshad, Fawzia Diva, Saifullah Saifi, Shamla Salim. Once again, a special thanks to all our panelists. Ravi Nair, Shireen Haq, Razia Sultana, Seema Samar, Dr. Sabah Gul Khattak.
actually, like Kushi said, you've opened up a lot of new avenues uh, related to the refugee issues, both on a personal level and policy level. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at the next SAPAN webinar on the last Sunday of next month. Goodbye for Thank now. You. Let's have a picture session. Over to you, Sarita, and uh, who's taking the picture? A picture uh, I already clicked the picture, so I'm going to stop the okay. recording and then pause the live. Okay. Thank you, everybody, once more. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.